Hello, welcome. Good evening, members. Uh, for those of you I've never met before, my name is Anna Spooner, part of the Tastings and Events team at the Wine Society. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of you joining this evening who I have met before, though. So welcome, particularly welcome back if you're rejoining after a lovely long Christmas break into the sip size uh, sessions that have become Mahesh and I's Tuesday nights. So welcome as well to Mahesh behind the scenes. Thank you as always for all your help this evening. Um, so if you are new to sip size very quickly, uh, this they, they're 45 minutes. We're going to talk about three wines, but we're certainly not going to do it a hardcore tasting. Instead, we're going to be talking about the wonderful region of Alsace. And we're hoping to bring to life the story of Alsace through these wines, but also through some slides that I'm going to show you. Uh, don't wait for me to start tasting if you would like to taste before. And I can already see some of you on the chat tasting other things. That's wonderful. Uh, but don't, certainly don't wait for me. I am going to taste the Joseph Catan uh, Eldel, sorry, pardon me, Eldel's Vicar first. So if you do want to start with a wine, perhaps that one might be a good one to start with if you have all three. I'm then going to move on to the Riesling and then we're going to finish with the Gewürztraminer this evening. So it's worth kicking off, I think. As always, pop some questions in the, uh, in the Q&A button. It's much easier for Mahesh and I to manage uh, but of course, if you want to chat to fellow members, please do use the chat as well. So without further ado, um, I, well, I've got a few slides to show you, but uh, I really more than possibly any other region in the whole of France feel that the map is essential for learning about the region of Alsace. The reason I say that is it is so close to the border of Germany, and that actually really dominates the history of the region. Uh, it's also got some quite interesting geological things going on, uh, which we'll talk about shortly, but I'd like to focus on history first. So ignore the silly glass, the glass is just for fun, but this green strip, and it is really a strip here that lives between the Vosges Mountains and the Black Forest in Germany. Uh, this strip is, is the region of Alsace, and it's where we're going to be heading this evening. So I've already mentioned Germanic history is key, uh, but let's throw some dates around. In the 17th century, it was annexed by France. Uh, it was then reclaimed by the German Empire in, 18, in the 1870s. But the German Empire um, was well, the new German Empire, I think is the official name. They were making very cheap, I'm just going to move this down so you can see me. Uh, they were using the vineyards to make very cheap blending wines. Uh, we then have the odium crisis, the phylloxera crisis that ravaged through general European vines, not just those um, of the northern France or northern Germany, as, as the case were at this, well, not quite northern, mid-Germany, as the case were at this stage. Um, but we so we have decimated vineyards here. After the First World War, Alsace went back to French rule and approximately one third of the sites were replanted and they picked the best sites, the sloped vines. And I'll show you a bit more about those in a moment. Um, but the major replanting didn't really happen until the 60s and 70s. So, yes, after the First World War, the French uh, regained control and, and did replant. But really the volume that we get out of Alsace, and volume is an interesting word to use because uh, it's not a powerhouse area like, say, Bordeaux or, or the Rhone, but the real volume and the bulk of the wine produced in Alsace, uh, a lot of it wasn't planted until the 60s or 70s. One thing that does, uh, quite frankly, is it means that the region is good value. Oh, pardon me, I've just lost my presentation, but I'll get it back up again. Uh, the region is good value. And uh, I personally, and this is a belief, not a fact, but I believe that's because it was relatively late to, you know, uh, to the party, shall we say. Uh, when you imagine places like Chateauneuf de Pap that have already in the 20s established, uh, in the 1920s established a, an AOC, uh, you have all of these rules and regs, they've got a brand. Um, Alsace didn't have that and, and actually has quite a confused brand. We'll go on to that in a bit, but consumers can get a little bit stuck when it comes to this region. 
And Mahesh and I were actually just talking before before the call, um, how in, saying, sorry, pardon me, how incredible value the Edelsvicker is, the first wine I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but you could say that for a huge amount of the wines of this region, top, top, top quality, but at really quite affordable prices. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about why the wines are so good. This is the region, the wine region itself. Um, now, I don't love this map just because of the colours, so I can I'm, I'm gladly send it around afterwards. I think if you're watching on a on a tablet or even worse, a TV far away from you, you won't necessarily get the colours here. But what I will say is, is the red uh, strip you can see is the vineyard. Now, it, within that, and I'm just sort of hovering over a few areas. Oh, my curse has gone. There we go. A few areas here. There are the Grand Cru vineyards something that I'll mention a little bit more about when we start to talk about why uh, or how the wines are, are designated in terms of quality. But the real thing to spot here is why, why on earth this line? Uh, there's a very good reason, really. Uh, the Vosges Mountains, and that's terrible French pronunciation, so I apologise, uh, they run alongside that seam on that strip. Um, now, what, do that, what does that do? What does that mean? This obviously is a, a slightly uh, simplified example, but it is showing you about windward and leeward side rain shadow. Now, we're not going to go into a geography lesson, don't worry, but I do think in terms of a fascinating feature, uh, this, is, this is a defining feature of the region. So it's important to know about it. What happens is the winds with carrying all the rain clouds, simplified version here, no geography degree for me, uh, unlike the rest of my family, but uh, the rain clouds come across. And what happens is the, the water vapor condenses when it reaches the peak of the mountain. And that's on the windward side and the rain falls there. Now, the Alsatian vineyards are on what's called the leeward side or the rain shadow. So actually they have some of the well, the only place I believe that has less rainfall than Alsace is Roussillon, right down in the south. So we have an area here that's in the north of France, looks like it should be cool, but uh, it, it has these long sunny days uninterrupted with no rain. Uh, so what, what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, it means that it can produce top quality white wine in particular. The coolness preserves the acidity. Uh, it's a little bit still too cold to get full phenolic ripeness in red grapes. But we have this beautiful um, ability to ripen white grapes, not only to the point of producing incredible dry white wines, but we can actually produce some sweet white wines as well that we'll get onto in a moment. Uh, I'll remove this because it can be confusing. There is no ocean by Alsace. <laughs> the ocean comes from further, further across, obviously. It's definitely not, <laughs> not got an ocean next to it. So I'll just take that down for a second, just to explain a few more minor features. Um, the best vineyards in Alsace get uh, the south, southwest or southeast exposure to get that extra sunshine. Um, and the best elevations are about... 170 to 500 meters so they can get quite elevated i mentioned the ability to to produce two different styles of sweet wine uh or i didn't say two but i'll tell you about those shortly but it can also recently has uh the the ability should we say to produce red wine not all styles of red wine you're not going to find syrah up there you're not going to find cabernet sauvignon up there but pinot noir is slowly becoming better quality. They've always produced Pinot Noir, and we'll talk about it in a moment, but the quality level hasn't been there. And most people believe the quality has increased for two reasons. And one is global warming, and the other is just better general red wine making practices. So we are far and away majority white wine. I'll give you the stats later, but we're also, uh, we do have pockets of red and these sweet wines and sparkling wines as well. So we have, you know, white grapes dominate, but there's definitely some red presence there too. The other really crucial thing about Alsace, again, a defining feature above all other areas, is that it has a patchwork of geology, um, a mosaic it often gets called. Um, considering that some wine regions might have a handful of, of major soils, major rock formations within, 
Alsace actually covers several uh, eras and uh, it's got all sorts of little intricacies. So it's got the Rhine Basin, but then obviously it has the mountainside and there are at least 20 major soil formations. There are no, there, there is nothing like this anywhere else in the world. Um, there's a few Australians that would argue that, that there are plenty of soil formations, but they are spread across a continent. This is in one region. So soil and, and the way that soil interacts with the grapevine and vice versa is really important in Alsace. This sort of demonstrates it, but doesn't, because actually what tends to happen is depending on your patchwork, you will grow your vines differently. So uh, different vines need different things. So if you've got uh, Gewurztraminer, for example, our final wine, but also a, wine, a component of the wine we're about to try, you need heat. You also probably want more of a clay soil. They tend to like that warming sensation, whereas Riesling, less so. So depending on what you're trying to get, you might grow your vines differently. You'll notice some of them are slightly different colors. Um, and this is quite typical, seeing all these little blocks like this. Uh, and I just think it's, it's gorgeous, actually. I think it's really beautiful. So I thought I'd share that picture with you. I would love to be able to pinpoint what geology each one was, but you can't tell um, from here. You probably, if you were a more trained Alsatian producer, be able to tell me which variety based on leaf color and direction of slope but I'm going to leave it here and just give you the information that over 20 soils uh major soil types I should say uh, plenty more soils if you want to cut them up like that um, and it just is a it makes for the most glorious interesting place to produce grapes and one of my personal favorites so let's start with wine number one uh, the reason we've chosen this wine is that it's a bit of a curiosity of the region uh, in the sense that there aren't many re regions that produce what we would describe as a, um, a multi-vintage blend. Now, this isn't, but legally you are allowed to make Edelsdicker as a multi-grape, multi-region blend, and you do not have to declare which vintages or even which grape varieties go into it. Now. I was talking to Mahesh before the call as well. They don't disclose the percentages. I can tell you which grapes go in, but legally they didn't even have to tell us that. Um, and also, strangely, Edelsvika can be a single variety, but still called Edelsvika. Um, it meets noble blend, but there's a bit of a misnomer there. Uh, the main difference is if you see gentil, gentle on the um, on the label and again not doesn't need to be used but if you do see it that means that over 50 percent of the grapes are what they call the noble varieties and i'll tell you what those are shortly but here you've got classic blend of grapes riesling muscat um gewurztraminer and pinot gris so it sort of has this lovely um i'll tell you what each of the grapes do shortly but it does have this lovely kind of grapey fruity aroma um, if you're tasting along please feel free to to have a, a little taste I think one thing that stood out for Mahesh and I earlier was the color um, very awful showing you color on a screen like this but if you can see slightly if I compare to the Riesling no um, it's actually slightly pink hued and that's because Gewurztraminer has a, a a pink hue to it and also Pinot Gris as well so those two great varieties look slightly more pinky on the vine. Um, and we were both suggesting that perhaps uh, Gewurz and Pinot Gris make up quite a large portion of this blend in order to achieve such a, a gorgeous color. Um, so in terms of the smells, the aromas, for me, it is beautifully fruity. I've got some floral in there. I've got some peach, white peach, apricots. Please feel free to say in the chat if you're, you're tasting along with me and get any of these things as well. Um, it is grapey. We're definitely getting grapes and Muscat does that. So we would expect that to happen. And that floral note I'm hoping is coming from the Gewurztraminer because that can have a beautiful blossom. And I think we're going to get some of that on the palate. So I'm going to have a taste with you now.
So the nice thing about this being a blend is that um, for me, there's a lovely freshness that Pinot Gris from Alsace brings. And it's got that. It's got a kind of refreshing quality to it. But it's also got lovely texture and mouthfeel. Um, and again, Gewurz, Pinot Gris both do a bit of that. And then I think there's probably less Riesling in here than uh, perhaps previous vintages. I'm not really getting that really sharp acidity through, but it's definitely lifted. Um, it's got a, a, that overall refreshing character. Um, I won't go into too much detail on producers this evening, um, but safe to say the whole region is dominated by, uh, by quite a few big players, but also there are loads of cooperatives. We've actually not used cooperatives this evening, but you could easily taste your way around top quality Alsace drinking cooperatives. Um, there are also a lot of families dating a long, long way back. So the Catins have dated back from the 1700s. Um, and what I find fascinating about the family, um, we wouldn't really call them a chateau, I suppose, the family houses, is that often um, you hear wonderful stories of the languages between the family is German and French and granddad spoke this. And uh, so it's a lovely sort of hodgepodge of cultures. So I do love particularly tasting from the uh, tasting from the family gang. So I'm going to show you something that looks scarier than it should. <laughs> I found it really hard to make this attractive. Um, so let's give it a go. But essentially what I want to do is explain to you the classification system in Alsace because it's actually probably, I would say, the easiest of all the classification systems in France, in my personal opinion. Um, but let's start with the AOC Alsace. So Alsace wines, if it's from Alsace and it's, uh, that's a bad example. Um, this is an Alsace wine. It will say Alsace on the label, Appellation Alsace Controle, the Gewurz Um Those wines are over 70% of the production of the region. So they really make up the most. It's only been an AOC, like I mentioned, since the 1960s. I think there's about 62. Um, and they are 90% white wines. So there's only that little 10% that make up uh, anything else. So by far and away dominated by the whites. In 2008, oh, and I should mention, here we go, the, uh, here are the great varieties that you can use. And uh, I will tell you a bit more about the varieties in a second, but you'll just see at the end, the little Pinot Noir, the red variety. Uh, but you can use all of the string of these grapes in order to produce AOC Alsace wine. In 2011, there was a little addition to AOC Alsace, and it's supplemented with basically two different extra bits you can add on. You can add communals or com communales, villages, so the actual village name, or Ludi, uh, the locality. Um, and without going into it too much, that's what our, um, our Riesling is striving for. They are less common, far less common, uh, but they don't count as Grand Cru. They're just a, a more specific placed version of the AOC Alsace. On the other hand, you have Grand Cru Alsace. Now, Grand Cru, top of the, top of the pyramid, uh, there's only 51 sites grand, labelled Grand Cru and Alsace, and you've seen how small some of them can be, and little pockets. So some of them really are sort of one vineyard. Uh, and the best example of that is the odd one out. These first four, Pinot Gris, Muscat, Gewurztraminer and Riesling, are the noble varieties. It was originally decreed that to be Grand Cru, you had to be made from the noble varieties. There is an exception. One little vineyard, Zotzenberg, has a Silvana plot that is so wonderful, it's been elevated to Grand Cru status. Interestingly, there's a few trying to do it with Pinot Noir at the moment, but as a general rule of thumb, if it's, it can only be a Grand Cru site if it's been specified in those 51%, but it also produces wine from those four grape varieties. So as you see, I find it much easier. There's a lot of sort of Germanic regiment or almost. I know that the AOC is a French one invented by French, but you can sort of see the systematic approach to saying, hey, these were these are the grapes that grow best here. Let's assume that only these four count. Uh, Grand Cru Alsace is also tiny, so it makes up only 4% of production. Very, very small. 
We then have two different styles of sweet wine, Vendage Tardif, VT, meaning late harvest. Again, the special grapes only, the noble varieties. Vendage Tardif just means they leave the grapes longer on the vine to get a bit more sweetness. Then you have the um, Selection de Grand de Nobile, and those are the wines that are left on the vine to raisin. So they literally are selecting the noble grains from the noble um, the noble varieties. And that's a lovely way to remember it. You sort of have Vendage Tardive that I'll go over how much sugar you can have in those in a minute. But you have your Vendage Tardive that's your late and then your SGM. It's even later. So uh, they sometimes get botrytis, which is lovely being near a river. But you don't have to have full botrytis to be an SGM. But last but not least, we have a beautiful sparkling wine and after Champagne, the most drunk sparkling wine inside France. So that should tell you something. Uh, Cremant d'Alsace. Now, Pinot Blanc is usually the base for the Cremant, the sparkling wine. Uh, but there's also some Riesling and often some Uxawa that we'll talk about in a sec. Some Pinot Noir as well, particularly if you're making a pinky one. So uh, we've obviously had a blend in that wine. So I can't tell you exactly what, what you were supposed to be looking for, for, for in what quantities, but I can quickly whiz through the grape varieties and give you some ideas of what they taste like. So I'm going to start with the four noble ones. Pinot Gris is uh, this. Well, we won't go too much into Gris Grigio because we've got an event coming up on that, but I did spot someone earlier drinking a Pinot Grigio. Technically, sort of the same grape variety. It is the same variety, but Pinot Gris, made in the Alsace style with these long sunny days, is big, structured, sometimes slightly smoky, but often with a kind of green woodland aroma as well. Muscat, fruity, tastes like grapes, usually vinified dry. So you, you would normally drink a, a bottle of wine that looks like this, full bottle with muscat, and you should expect it to be dry more often than not. Gewürz Tramina, very full bodied, we'll have one at the end, famous for the Turkish delight spices, the tropical notes like light cheese, flowers. Riesling, one of the most loved white grapes in the world, uh, elegant, finesse, refined, beautiful high acid. Um, and if you're a Riesling, German Riesling drinker, the difference I would say is that the Alsatian wines are a uh, dry so they're usually dry i've mentioned the sweet wines make up a small portion unlike the german ones that do make up a larger portion so they're usually dry and they're often more sort of higher alcohol and a bit more gutsy and powerful i would say the german styles are slightly more refined uh, pinot blanc usually the base for the cremant as i mentioned soft delicate it's a bit of a good all-rounder and it takes winemaking well so for the same reason People uh, use Chardonnay and Champagne. It takes winemaking well, oak and lees and all of these sorts of winemaking techniques. Silvana is going out of fashion, fresh, light, delicate. Uh, you can find some good ones, but sadly it's being grubbed up and replaced by other things. Uh, Uxawa, it is planted and there's a real confusion here that it's actually... You can label a, a wine Pinot Blanc and it can have some Uxawa in it and the blend a very odd little niggling rule that bothers me a bit. Um, but Uxawa, you can actually get some beautiful single variety Uxawa too. Uh, Chesela, usually used for blending and very, very few producers still, still make a varietal wine out of it. Pinot Noir, I mentioned, was lean and astringent, but now is improving. Uh, and some there's some good producers that are trying to find Grand Cru sites for it. And there's one I've sort of missed, um, which is Chardonnay. And you are allowed to put Chardonnay into your Cremant d'Alsace. So it's only allowed in the Cremant in the sparkling wine uh, and nowhere else. So I'm telling you what, let's go on to our Riesling because I think people will be a little thirsty. So uh, I've just flashed up a little picture there, but I'll take it down in just a moment. Um, Riesling, I won't go into too much just picked up the wrong one. No, I haven't. Um, Riesling, I won't go into too much detail on. And the reason I won't is we've got a um, Riesling event uh, pre-recorded that you can watch to really learn about the grape variety. But what I would say is that the Rieslings of Alsace are um, those, they're sort of, they epitomize what you can do with different soil types. 
And I find that really interesting. They they really are um, wanting to avoid sort of field blending Rieslings. They are careful and conscious to make sure that each of their plots is planted to the right variety. And one of those is, is Riesling. Um, but they are very, very cautious to grow it on either the slate or the shale or, or the granite. And when you listen to Alsatian producers talk about their Riesling, soil is really key. Um, this family have 23 hectares. Um, they are a beautiful, um, a beautiful family estate from the 1850s. Um, and well, sorry, they've been there longer than the 1850s. They've been there about 400 years, but they've been making wine since the 1850s. Um, and they do make a range of wines, but this is their Riesling Brandluft. And uh, I won't go into too much detail, but Brandluft is one of the uh, regions that's trying to get promoted and it's got a really, really good reputation. So it's made very carefully. The fruit is hand harvested. They saw everything in the winery on arrival. Um, they really look after the grapes to make a sort of intense, uh, smelly, but lovely. Um, yeah, smelly, but lovely Riesling. So let's have a quick taste and a smell. I'm getting, I'm just going to get my Riesling slide up for you just to help you. I find that visual cues can be, can be nice. I didn't want to do it for the last one because there were a lot of things going on in the blend, but Hopefully you might get a few of these things because these are typical characters of Riesling. For me, I'm getting really subtle floral notes and some really nice citrus aromas. I also get a lot more green apple in this than I did in the last wine, if you're tasting along with all of them. Maybe even a touch of pear. I'd be happy to say pear. Generally, when you get those uh, petroly aromas in Riesling, uh, it tends to be an older wine or new world wines that for some reason um, are aging quicker. They think it might be uh, loads and loads of sunlight, but that's what this petrol aroma is here. And there's also steel. It was quite hard to find steel. So if you're getting any of those, please write in the chat. I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see what you think. Yeah, I get grass, Stephen. Absolutely. I do get those kind of green notes. Let's have a taste. Yeah, I'm getting some lovely grass. Yes. The thing that immediately shouts at me, and I hope it shouts at you too in the most lovely way, is I can't talk now. My mouth's watering so much. Riesling does that. It gives you this intense salivation. Um, but this particular one, it's not um, astringent or too lean. I've got a lovely richness in the mouth. I really do feel like I've just bitten into a green apple and I'm sort of salivating and excited and almost a green apple with maybe some white peach as well. Uh, there is some lemon in there, but green apple for me is dominating. Um, yes, Beth, I think there is a little honeydew melon. I think there's a, um, I think there's that slightly tropical. We talked about how much sunshine there is here and Riesling when it gets the extra sunshine definitely moves into the more tropical realm. So I definitely would go for that. And I think the nice thing about being specific about honeydew melon is it is that honeyed note to it. And uh, that is another key thing about Riesling, the beautiful honeyed flavour without being sweet. <clears throat> Pardon me. Oh, yeah, that was delicious. Mahesh has got that wine, so, uh, <laughs> so he'll be pleased. I like Oliver's comment. It's packing zing. Yeah, if you guys are getting petrol, then great. I actually just didn't get very much petrol. Um, if you are getting petrol, that that's certainly not a wrong thing. You might have found that your bottle was, I don't know, bottled a, a couple of weeks before mine. Um, maybe not a couple of weeks, but a couple of months. I might be on batch two. Um, or storing differently as well. I only picked mine up uh, from the Wine Society a couple of days ago. Riesling tends to be a sort of developed flavour, so it's something that isn't a naturally occur sorry, petrol. It isn't naturally occurring normally when you press it. It's something that develops over time. Mm. I'm just going to flick back to this slide to mention again, um, I said I was going to give you some stats on the sweet wines. Um, I thought about doing it after the Gewurz, but Gewurz can be very confusing. And I don't want you to be confused thinking that this Gewurz is sweet. It's very fruity, but it's dry. So I thought I'll deal with the sweetness now. Let's move it on and get out of the way. And then we'll uh, talk 
a little bit about some cultural traditions and then we'll finish off with our final one. So, um, Vendage Tardive or the Selection de Grand Nubile can both um, feature all four of those wines I've mentioned. So Gewurz, Pinot Gris, Riesling or Muscat. And specifically, it's an Alsatian Muscat. It only happens in um, exceptional years and there has to be enough moisture in the air um, in all, well, moisture without rot or without the bad rot. So you do only get it in good years. As I mentioned, Vendage Tardive means late harvest. And then the selection de Grand Nobile is, is botrytis infused. So they go through and they pick different berries and they try to pick as many of the botrytis berries as possible. Now, for anyone who has perhaps never tried a botrytized wine, we're not trying one this evening. Uh, the value of the uh, three wines on the tasting would have shot up because they're not cheap wines but I can certainly send a link out if anyone's interested in trying them. But um, botrytized wines in general, if you were to have tried one, it probably more likely would have been um, one of the wines from Southwest France. So a Montbaziac or a Sauterne. Those are also botrytized affected. Now, um, Selection de Grand Nobile has a slightly different rule that goes above and beyond just some botrytized fruit, which is that it actually has a minimum grams per litre which is quite a Germanic thing to do. So uh, whereas you could probably get away with maybe more on not having quite the right sugar content in, in uh, you wouldn't get away with quality, but you could certainly get away with sugar content differentiation down in Southwest France. It is very strict here on what the grapes have to be minimum sugar. So to give you an idea, the minimum, and I'm going to have to read these because I'm awful at numbers for anyone who hasn't been to one of my events before, uh, it's two, three, five grams per litre for Muscat and Riesling Vendage Tardif and two, five, seven, so a little bit more for Pinot Gris and Gewürztraminer. Traminer. Then we go up a rank and it's two, seven, six for Muscat and Riesling on uh, Selection de Grand Nouville and it's three, oh, six for Pinot Gris and Gewürztraminer. Traminer. Now, at three, oh, six, those wines are some of the highest must weights in France. So they are some of the sweetest and some of the most luscious. So they are really indulgent, beautiful wines. Um, I have to say the Riesling ones for me are particularly special, um, but I think that's just to do with, with my palate and, and maybe being used to German sweet wines made from Riesling as well. But they are very, very special. So let's quickly, sorry, I'm going to have to whiz past these now again. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about winemaking traditions. And the reason I've put this picture up is I think it's actually quite hard to interpret uh, how different this is to your sort of classic French wine growing region. Um, the Germanic influence is very present um, and it's present in some of the things I've already spoken about. So having very regimented rules and structures and a quite simplified AOC system. But also there's a few other things that make it quite a Germanic um, wine producing region. One is that the bottles are flute shaped. And by law, wines of Alsace, Alsace AOC and above, so basically any of the wines I've just showed you on that grid, have to be bottles in a flute. Now, there's quite a lot of dispute and discussion around that. Is it good for building the brand of Alsace? Probably. Does it make consumers nervous about them on the shelf? Possibly that as well. Um, I will never forget a, a friend of mine. I had brought a lot of Alsatian wine home to the flat I used to live in. And she assumed that all uh, wines and flutes were dry. And so she went to the supermarket and bought a very, very, very sweet German Riesling and was quite shocked when she had dinner. So that flute and assuming that one thing is another or one thing is one way and it's not necessarily true can be a little bit dangerous. I personally love them, so I'm happy to keep them. One other German inherited factor is you don't often see in France varietal labelling. So again, nice and clearly on the bottle, Gewürztraminer. Uh, that is not a uh, typical thing to do in France. They normally tell you where it's grown and then you have to do the digging to find out what's inside it. The French, um, that's how their AOC system works. Alsatians have overlaid a more Germanic way of telling you what's in the bottle on top of the AOC system. 
Uh, another thing that's quite different is even the smallest producers might have six to eight bottles that they produce. And the larger ones could do 20, 30 different types of wine. So when you go on an Alsatian uh, producer's website, it can be a bit of a minefield. But a lot of it comes down to what I mentioned about that sort of crisscross patchwork of soils. So they will tend, rather than blending different sites, they'll vinify different bits um, independently. So you can taste their brand loved Riesling vineyard, but you can also taste five other Rieslings of different vineyard sites. So when it comes to experimenting and learning about wine, I think there's very few places that are as crystal clear as Alsace. I already mentioned that they're big on cooperatives. So um, out of four to 5,000 growers, less than a quarter actually do bottle their own wine like these guys. Um, and over 60% of the fruit generally will go to a co-op. So that's a very big difference as well. And then lastly, before we go on to our final one, I do want to mention, because I think it's very special, um, they're probably, well, they are, not probably at all, they're the most significant organic and biodynamic region in France. Um, 14, and it's nearing 15% now, I think, um, of their total plantings are cultivated uh, through organic or biodynamic practices. And the thing that gives them that advantage really is that sunshine, that that long, dry summer. And then when you have an exceptional year, you get the sort of humid late autumn that allows you to make the sweet wines. But you do not have to worry about spraying um, as you push on later into the into the season, which is a fear. A lot of organic and biodynamic producers don't want to have the fear of rains, mists, fog in, in September, that means that they'll have to intervene in a non-organic way. So it's quite special, actually. Um, yeah, the statistics are amazing. So keep going on the organics. Um, it's a really impressive thing. So let's go on to our final wine. I think I've got one more picture. Maybe not. I thought I had one more, but I've obviously lied. Um, but we'll go on to our final one. And then I think I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. So I mentioned Gewürztraminer can be sweet. And actually, a lot of German ones are and some Alsatian ones are. But actually, in Alsace, in Alsace you are more likely to find uh, the drier versions. And that's what we have here. And when I'm using that term dry, I do mean low, almost no sugar comparatively. And I don't know the sugar content this but it's probably less than eight grams per liter do not hold me to that i told you numbers weren't my strong point but it is it will be sort of in that dry scale let's go with 12 just to be safe but realistically it will be under 12 grams per liter and we've just talked about the fact that some of the uh Gewürz sweet wines are over 300 so chalk and cheese here chalk and cheese um now it hasn't got it on the label because this is actually a blend of a couple of vineyards, but it's actually mainly from one of Hugel's top Grand Cru vineyards called Sporin. Um, the 2017 is a great vintage, so I'm kind of glad we were umming and ahhing about the vintage, but I'm sort of glad that this one's the one that's available. Um, in terms of smells, I poured mine at the beginning, and I have to be honest, when I first opened it, it wasn't uh, giving me as much as I'd have liked. So if you're thinking, oh, I wanted more from this, I was expecting more, please, um, yeah, let it sit in the glass. Uh, it should be things like rose petals, uh, a hint of spice. I've got, oh, that's what I've got. I've got you a Gewurz slide. I probably had more fun pulling together the Gewurz slide than any other slide. So we'll use it because it is a good tool. Um, but that's that pink hue I mentioned earlier, Gewurz having that lovely sort of, uh, it doesn't, the flesh is still white. It's, you're not going to produce a red wine with good Gewurz, but it is a lovely pinky color. Um, so here's a few options. See what you smell. And if you've got another Gewurz that you're not tasting the same with us, then you might smell other things. For me, the three things, four, that's, I'm going to go five. <laughs> the five things for me that say we have a Gewurz are Turkish delight. And this is subjective. This isn't a hard and fast rule. But for me, these are the things that go ding, 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 ding in my brain if I'm blind tasting. Turkish delight. How many other wines in the world smell like Turkish delight or grape varieties, I should say? Not too many. 
Some other grape varieties smell like roses. Yes. Um, Barolo smells like roses, for example, which is a red wine. But that Turkish, Turkish delight and rose combination, I'm already thinking, hmm, I think I know what this is. Uh, lychees. I've had Gewürztraminer Tramina before that smells like a lychee martini. It's incredible. Um, marmalade is also another quite good one that tends to be on the more sweet style wines, but you can still pick it up sometimes on the drier ones. And then nutmeg. Nutmeg is quite an unusual, um, an unusual descriptor to get alongside all of those other ones. So when it's, when it says on the wine, um, note a hint of spice, the spices I would be looking for, Annoyingly, this ginger for me isn't right. It's usually dried ginger when it's Gewürztraminer. Um, dried ginger, and I did make the slides, so I've only got myself to blame, but looking at a pile of dried ginger wasn't glaringly obvious, but it was. But normally I get dried ginger, nutmeg, and then a bit of cinnamon. So it's no surprise people do drink Gewürztraminer at Christmas because it's got this lovely um, Christmassy feeling to it. Um, now, the Hugels who produce this wine are absolutely world-class Ingevertstraminer. So uh, there's, it's no surprise that we do use them for our exhibition. Um, they do also make fantastic late harvest wines, which, as I mentioned, would have made this tasting incredibly uh, more expensive. But um, yeah, if you, if you want to try some, then we can certainly direct you uh, to some good options at the Wine Society. They are just made in tiny quantities, so you have to grab them while you can. Let's have a quick taste. Mm. so I think it's really fun to taste these final two wines next to each other and if you have got any left please go back to the two my mouth's not really watering in the same way it's salivating but it's not I'm not feeling this sort of rush of saliva there is still some though which is is evidence of a really really good uh producer of Gewürztraminer Ge because the fear is it can go a bit flabby but it's got this nice freshness, but that lychee is really coming through now. Ripe fruit I've just seen. Absolutely, it's very ripe. Those green apples have been moved into melons, almost squashed peaches. The peaches have been bashed around a bit and you're getting kind of like a, an, a strong juice. Definitely um, getting the lychee for me. I'm tasting the rose petals almost. I'm tasting a kind of, um, in the most pleasant way, I'm tasting a sort of potpourri, but I guess really that's the Turkish delight, isn't it? That rose rose water effect. Um, so I'm definitely getting a bit of that as well. I loved it. Um, and I know that Mahesh behind the scenes loves Gewürz Traminer as well. I'm hoping that there's some members uh, who also like Gewürz um, because it's such a wildly misunderstood grape variety. I think people are a bit nervous about it. Um, I don't know whether, I've just noticed this as well, it definitely has a higher alcoholic feeling than the last two wines as well. Um, not out of balance by any stretch, because I think it's more powerful than the last two wines. And often with that power, you need to sort of balance it with something. But I can definitely feel it. I'm I'm very much more aware that I've had that Gewürz than either of the other two wines. So uh, there we go. Right, I'm going to quickly, we've got two minutes, so fingers crossed I can get a few um, Q&As down. Oh, um, I'll start with Anne and uh, David and Tim, because I've just had people, uh, I've just had two people ask the same question at the same time in two different places. What food goes with Gewürz? Now, a lot of people say that they have Gewürz Dramana with Indian food or Asian food, I should say, more broadly. I don't actually like that as much as I would... Um, yeah, as much as it seems to get raved about. Now, um, I find that I am not one of the people that likes high spice with high uh, alcohol. What I would say is I have just seen someone say Thai. Of all the Asian cuisines, I find the lemongrass in the aromatics and Thai food is the best Asian cuisine to match with Gewürztraminer. However, I wouldn't go, you know, smacking a hold of a load of fresh chilies on something. I'd probably go with something a bit milder. Um, and as I'm even saying it, I'm thinking maybe not actually, maybe something more like a satay or a massaman as well. So um, yeah, you can go Asian, but actually one thing that's really delicious with Gewürztraminer is Munster cheese. Um, so I think, yeah, you can be a bit more experimental um, or perhaps, yeah, also prawns with the sweet 
nature of prawns, I find a lot of prawn dishes um, are very, very nice with Kvart's Tramina. But be experimental. Don't just stick to Thai cuisines and specifically Munster, um, Munster cheese and, for me, prawns done in a sort of light uh, sauce. Ah, oh, somebody's eating an Aran cheese with crushed herbs and the wines go fantastically. I'm really pleased. Good. Um, I why does why doesn't oh sorry this is a question more about delivery why doesn't the wine society offer the tasting in a package i.e all three wines um what we try and do is just put as much information early on um into the uh onto the website so you can buy as many as possible um but unfortunately our team in the warehouse can't uh, fulfill all of our tasting needs so we're only able to package up when there's six wines in a tasting rather than three um but christine who asked that question let us know in advance if there's other things you want to add because i think that that would be um your best solution maybe you'll do two sip sizes or something and we are really endeavoring to get our wines up faster uh, we've had as i'm sure you don't understand quite a few logistical challenges over the last few months uh, but we are trying our best to get as much wine information up as quickly as possible. Um, now, I've had one question on Pinot Gris and the sweetness of Pinot Gris, um, and then I will answer one final question, which I think has been going crazy in the chat. Um, Paul and Susan have said that they've been enjoying Alsace wines for at least 50 years, probably more than most British drinkers, I would agree. Uh, they even served a Pinot Gris at their daughter's wedding. However, we've noticed in past 10 years that many of the wines we love have become much sweeter. Now, have we changed or have they? Um, I would probably argue, Paul and Susan, they might not necessarily have become sweeter, but I think they'll have become more fruity. And I think this is a really, really fair point to make. Alsace, Alsace wines tend, very much tend, uh, but, you know, vast, vast, vast majority to be dry. So very low residual sugar, other than those two I mentioned. However, they are subject to those very, very long sunny days. And uh, in Alsace, over the last 35 years, it's gone up two degrees um, due to global warming um, on average summer temperatures. Now, you might not think that sounds like a lot, but really what that does is that turns Alsace from a cool climate region into a moderate climate region. And when you do that, or when that happens, it can be happening slowly, but you've clearly witnessed it. You can definitely end up... Um, the, the DNA of the grape, the way the phenolics, phenolics ripen, pardon me, will change. So um, you see it in, I'll give you an example of where you see it most easily, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire, same grape variety as Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand gets so much more sunshine that it becomes tropical. And there are other things at play. Um, so there are, you know, various clones and the way it's planted and trellising but fundamentally that extra sunshine changes the nature of the fruit and um, so you will get more sugars but they get converted to alcohol which is where the whole alcohol debate comes in but you also change those phenolics so you get uh, where you might have once had a white crunchy peach on a on a pinot blanc let's say you might now be getting a nectarine uh, and it's incredible how that happens. So you're sort of slowly witnessing uh, that change over time, which is quite amazing uh, in my eyes. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit scary. A lot of people have said that potentially Alsace might be one of the most affected because of those long summers. They might actually have one of the biggest um, impacts disproportionately so to some of the other regions. Um, I will quickly uh, whiz through. Well, somebody's asked for a wine society tour of Alsace. I'd say yes, um, <laughs> but we'll see. I think there's been a lot of debate on uh, the chat on opinions on Coravan. Personally, I use a Coravan. That's all I'm going to say, and I'll leave it there. I think Coravan's fantastic. Uh, they are expensive. Uh, it depends on what wine you're drinking. I wouldn't open a five pound wine with it, but there we go. Um, and then just, oh, sorry, I've just lost one particular question, which was about service temperatures of Riesling, which I'm going to quickly do because I'm conscious we've overrun. Um, but service temperatures of Riesling, um, I think it was the Riesling, and apologies, I'll just quickly run through them all. Um, Gewurztraminer working backwards. If you serve that too cold, you lose some of the aromatics, but if you serve it too warm, you lose the acidity. So Alsace is a um, challenge to serve. 
I would say it's one of those wines that you probably want to experience a little lifeline in the glass. You, your first glass might not be as exciting as, as your second, put it like that. Um, I find it a real, real challenge to serve Gewurz Um Then the Riesling, pardon me, I think that's best ice cold out the fridge. Um, Riesling is just lovely and it's designed to be fresh and gorgeous. Um, obviously, that that can vary slightly between wines. You might want to leave it out for a little bit, but as a general rule of thumb, straight out the fridge. And then the Edelsnicker, it's really hard to say because this wine was lovely straight out of the fridge, but because of everything I said, we don't know what vintages it might be. We don't know what uh, grapes might be in there. There is no hard and fast rule. Um, I think it's just going to be a bit of an experimentation on that. But luckily, they tend to be... Um, they tend to be the most affordable of all the Alsace wines uh, in general. So you hopefully won't waste your money popping one in the fridge, one out the fridge, see what happens. Anywho, there we go. We did it. We were just six minutes over, but we did answer a few questions. So uh, yes, I'm glad that I got through the presentation on time because that doesn't always happen. <laughs> Um, but a huge thank you to Mahesh for everything behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to have to sit and read the chat. I couldn't keep up, but I'm going to have to see. There's been some good debate, um, which I've been really enjoying. So we'll have a, a go through those and see if you've had any ideas. I will send around the presentation tomorrow for anyone that wants it, but just reply to the email rather than me mass sending you um, mass sending you all of the information but if you want it it's there for you recording will be available tomorrow on youtube um and i hope to see you at the next we've got two weeks until our next sip size but we've got a slightly more in-depth thing starting next week focus on um where i'm going to be exploring old vines next wednesday uh, so if you are keen to do some more deep diving into topics then that might be for you but by all means just keep coming to the sip size if not Thank you all very much and thank you for Mahesh's help and good evening and goodbye.